keep your ears open to yeah. all genres. Because if you're gonna make a living in music, most of us have to really expand and be able to teach, be able to do workshops, write books, keep creativity at the core and just send it every which way. Jennifer, welcome to the Sessions, the Artist Series, and we thank you so much for your time to come by here and just give us a little bit of an insight into a life and a career that I have seen for over the past several years that I am so impressed. I've heard you perform, I've heard you speak at events. You really have such great, great quality artistic skills that are really at a high level. Well, bless you. That was worth showing up for right there. I can go home. <laughs> Thank you. It really is. I'm so impressed. Where did music start for you? At a young age? Did it enter at a young age? Where did it hit your soul? It, it hit my soul. It was two things. Uh, First, my sister had a guitar, and I didn't, and that, I was very jealous. <laughs> like, she gets everything, so I let my parents know the next Christmas, I'm next. And, and I ended up getting an electric guitar for my first guitar, which way back then was a really rare thing. Yeah. So I think that made a difference in keeping me going, because I got the coolest thing on earth. <laughs> Although it's, you could probably buy it for 50 bucks today, right? But it looked like um, I, the, the other half that really motivated me was seeing the Beatles on that Sullivan show. You know, in my whole town, I lived in this little town in upstate New York, and the whole town was Beatle crazy. February of 1964. When okay. When it hit on Ed Sullivan, that's what it did. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just resonated with me, and it, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And when you're that age, it, it wasn't, you know... I heard a voice, and it was the Beatles' voice. Whether it was Paul singing one song or yeah. John, it was just to me, it was the Beatles' sound, and the guitars front and center on stage. How beautiful! How beautiful! Yeah. So, did you start then taking it more seriously? Did you start taking lessons? How'd you learn it? Yeah, I started taking lessons immediately and learning how to read music in a local music shop. And uh, when I was nine, the family moved to the West Coast, so I ended up with a, another teacher. Well, my dad rented a house for a year, having another house built. So once the other house was built, I moved somewhere else <laughs> within San Diego and ended up with a different teacher. So each teacher that I had brought something completely different to the table. Mm. The first one was very basic, um, I think the Alfred books, learning the, the basics, first three notes on the <laughs> strings you, kind of yeah. thing. And then the next teacher I remember was a, a folk teacher started teaching me right hand finger picking techniques. Mm -hmm. the next guy was a blues guy, the next guy was a rock guy. So it was really cool to, to be immersed with all that. Plus my dad, he was not a professional musician, he was a doctor, but he was a jazz freak. And that was always playing in the house. So what was being played? What was your dad playing? Big band Chico stuff? Chico Hamilton. Ch Chico Hamilton, drummer, yeah. Joe Pass. Yeah. In fact, uh, after I got out, at, oh, I think it was during when I was at GIT, I asked him who Jim Hall was, and wow. he sent me home with a stack of LPs and said, this is who he is. What? Because you can't put it in words. It's Absolutely. like, this is who he is. Absolutely. And you mentioned Joe Pass. Yeah. Joe Pass, who I had met several times. This was serious. You were listening to these great players yeah. at a young age. It's, it's wow. in the DNA. I don't know how deeply it got in the, the gray matter. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it was a wonderful backdrop as soon as he was home from work. Records were on until he went to sleep. So now you started meeting musicians, you started playing in bands. What happened at that point? Uh, actually, one other thing, when I, when I was a kid in upstate New York, my mother was uh, president of the Arts Council, hmm. so we'd bring people through. There was an Argentinian guitarist named George Morell that stayed at our house when he came through. Um, so I was able to see him practice hours a day, classical stuff. It was really, really rich. Wow. Uh, and then we, went to, we moved to San Diego, and that was all my teenage years, and I started getting into more rock, um, and just whatever was going on at the time, Jethro Tull, that kind of stuff. It's just my ears were growing and growing. So were there other musicians in the area that you could meet up with and play with? Were they? Oh, well, funny you should say that, because I got to the point where I was tired of just practicing in my bedroom, <laughs> and there was a local music shop way before the internet, of course, that had... They came up with a Rolodex card system with uh, musicians that wanted to find other ones. Would you put your name and what kind of music you're into and your instrument and your phone number? 
And I, I was so excited when I saw that. I go, man, I'm going to be in a band. And wrote down all these names and took them home. And my, my mother said, you are not going to go out at night and play with strangers. <laughs> so I never gigged until I was 21. Oh, my God. That yeah. Rolodex was like Craigslist ahead of the time. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> yeah. It was gold for a minute. <laughs> yeah. So you meet other musicians, so you start playing. It wasn't until after GIT and my, my first thing I did was get together, well, I was into the real book at that time, because I was, a, at that time it was a serious jazz school. There okay. was two serious bebop players, Joe DiOrio and Ron Day, yeah. and Don Mock was jazz, but more fusion side, McLaughlin right. Right. kind of stuff. Right, right. And um, my, my first gig, I made $12.50 at some restaurant playing tunes from the real book with another guitar player. And uh, th it was kind of stunning because we, we rehearsed for weeks and weeks getting tunes down and staring at paper. <laughs> and then we go to the restaurant and we're staring at paper and it's, all of a sudden there's people looking at <laughs> us and we're staring at paper. That sucked. <laughs> so that was a lesson in, you know, memorizing. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're doing a show now. <laughs> so now your skills are developing because of the needs. Now you're out performing. So that was great. And memorizing, that's a very, very important skill. The real book, which has endless amounts of songs yeah. in there. Yeah. So you start working on all these different songs. You're learning more songs. You're playing with other musicians. Yeah, it, it went quickly, maybe within a couple of years, uh, going from playing jazz duets to uh, getting in a band. Right. And at that point, there was a, I saw a band in San Diego open up for Lee Rittenauer. Hmm. And I thought, God, these guys are local, they're great, they're doing originals, I want to be in that band. And something about putting that seed into the universe, I didn't make any calls, and within a week, they called me looking for a new guitar player. And so I ended up in, with that, in that band and really cut my teeth with them, um, starting with some fusion stuff, George Duke, that, that kind of stuff, and, and then we'd get gigs uh, doing weddings. So how'd they get your name? Was it the Rolodex? How'd they, how'd they track you down? You know, I don't remember. It's so long ago. Well, you must have been doing something right that they were aware of what you were doing. Yeah. That must have led them to, to want to have you. That's, fa that's fantastic. And uh, that same band ended up being a top 40 cover band for a little while, too. So it was, it was a really, really great learning experience. And how well did GIT prepare you for all this? GIT kicked my butt. Interesting. I, in fact, I flunked the test to get in. I had been taking these lessons for years and years and years and knew a bunch of songs, a bunch of techniques. But when it came time to take the test to get in, um, one, of the, one of the things I was asked to play uh, with the president at that time, said, play a G major seven chord. And the only G I knew that had a seven was like first position, cowboy, dominant G seven chord. <laughs> and he asked me a few other things. And I, I had gone to Pasadena City College and taken some theory. So I had that kind of stuff together, but it wasn't really integrated into my playing mm. yet. So I went back to San Diego and studied with Peter Sprague, a monster jazz player, for six really intense months. And that was enough to get me into the school. Fantastic, so now you're in the school, you're learning, you're prepared, now you're doing these bands, you're doing cover songs, you're doing a wide variety of songs. What was the next step from there? Where did your career go from that point? After three years of playing a lot with that band, uh, the bass player, he had been from LA and he decided he wanted to go back there. And it seemed like immediately he got a gig with Johnny Rotten, with mm -hmm. the Sex Pistols, uh, with. Uh, his new band was called Public Image. And we're in San Diego going, now wait a minute, we, we want to <laughs> go on the road too. So one by one, we all trot up to LA looking for fortune and fame. And uh, gosh, that was 1984 that mm. I moved up. 1987, I got the, the call to audition for Michael Jackson. How'd you so, get that call? One of his people called Musicians Institute because at that time, once I moved to LA, I was teaching there. So um, they called there and said, send us two players. And I was one of the lucky people that got to go audition. How incredible. So yeah. his, so Michael Jackson's organization contacts the school yeah. and requests two players to audition. Yeah. That is unbelievable. I know it is. <laughs> it's, there's been a few fairy tale things in my life that are 
that, that doesn't <laughs> happen in real life, you know? Incredible. How yeah. was that audition? I mean, at the time, you know, listen, Michael Jackson still is one of my incredible, you know, heroes in, 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 as a writer, a singer, a performer, a dancer. Oh, everything, yeah. Doing it all. And, and huge, huge, you know, we, we, he's huge. You walk in, what happened at the audition? Well, interestingly enough, I, I asked what tunes to learn and when the last possible time I could go in was so I could just stay home and just knock those things into the gray matter. <clears throat> Bought my first CD player so I could hear more clearly than a cassette. That was, <laughs> at, you that know, at that time, yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. Just yeah. the, the changeover of different technology, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I went in and saw there was no band. It was just me and a video camera, go. And the, the only guidance I was given was that most of the gig would be funky rhythm. And uh, so I improvised something, then I started soloing. I had, at that time, by the time I got the Jackson gig, I had done three demos with Michael Sambello mm. for my first record. Right. And one of the things, I'd, I had worked out this tapping thing for Giant Steps. So I played that, and then... You played Giant Steps? Yeah. <laughs> but this, this, that's the Giant Steps out of Michael Jackson. Well... <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it was kind of a rock inversion and yeah. tapping and distorted tone and stuff. <laughs> in in the cover band in San Diego, as soon as Beat It came out, I'll, I'll never forget it. We we were setting up at a rehearsal, and that came on the radio, and everybody just stopped like that guitar solo. Holy crap! That that was just stunning. Yeah. So I set out to learn that and failed three times. Finally got it, and then so. Years later, uh, at the audition, I finished the audition with playing the Beat It solo. How great. You know, people always ask me, well, what, what was it that made him want to pick you? And I yeah. said, I never asked. I just said, thank you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and uh, gosh, a couple of years ago, uh, a buddy of mine, Steve Swirsky, is doing a, a film on female guitar players. And he tracked down the guy that shot the video of that audition. So 20 years go by, or maybe even more, and I saw it, and it's, it's hysterical. <laughs> I was trying so hard to look cool, and I was so clueless. Thank goodness they had a costumer to <laughs> get me up to speed. What was it like? I mean, first of all, how was it to get the call to say you're in? Well, the call wasn't that. The call was, uh, Michael's interested, can you come down, rehearse with the band, and can you take a year off? And I said, take me anywhere for le any length of time. And so I went in, and day after day after day, I'd play, and I was working my butt off. Uh, With the full band? Yes. Yeah, Ricky Michael, Lawson. And Michael was there, Don Ricky Boyette. Lawson. God bless yeah. his soul. Yeah, oh, he was, I couldn't have asked for a, a better group of people yeah. to, for a rookie, you know? And who was in the band at that time? Ricky Lawson, Don Boyette, Greg Fillingaines was the musical director, yeah, was John Clark was the other guitar. Who am I missing? Guitar, bass, drums. Uh, Chris Carell mm. was a keyboard player. And uh, actually, it was three keyboard players. Rory Kaplan yeah. was another one. So you're rehearsing with Michael, and what was that like? Well, it wasn't with Michael yet. We, we spent a month just as the band. And a lot of that time was tweaking sounds. I mean, God, they had programmers, you know, trying to get all the sounds that are on the record, because right. those songs were so popular that the EQ on the snare is ingrained in people's heads. Yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of effort put into sound. Um, so we rehearsed for a month before we met Michael, and uh, I was just subbing out all my other work all this time, and, and not telling anybody about it. Because how much would it suck to say, I got the Michael Jackson gig, and then it doesn't happen, <laughs> you know? So mum was the word, I just subbed, subbed out with no explanation. You got a cover for me. So a month in, we moved to a bigger sound stage, and we had heard that if Michael's happy with the music, he'll probably start dancing. And he came in and started dancing right away. Oh, great. Yeah, I came in with his manager. It's like, that vision is frozen in my mind forever. The yeah. manager with the cigar and the ponytail, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, did, I just remember being introduced to him, and I just thought, it's just very magical, stunning, radiant energy. And when he came in and he started dancing, what was that first rehearsal like with him? Did he start singing with the band? And I'm sure he did, yeah. Just... So now you're hearing Michael Jackson yeah. with the band that you're in. This had to be surreal at such a high level. Oh, it was. It was. And, and even on stage, people say, well, what's it like to play to 100,000 people? And it's, it was always surreal. Mm. Always. Yeah. It's, uh, part of it, especially the last tour, I felt like I was in a theater production because I had that leather mask and horrendous... 
<laughs> so horrendous. So uh, the, the costume, it was the first time I had any, you know, crazy costumes, and then they decided to whack out my hair. And it was just a whole transformation yeah. on every possible level. And how did that feel, you know, playing music, I mean, here you are still a, a diehard musician or what it is, all that showbiz stuff is going on. Yeah. How, how, how did you maintain just your composure to stay focused? <laughs> we rehearsed our butts off. That's Interesting. how. Interesting, okay. Yeah, and that, that okay. is one of the takeaways that I tell people that, um, boy, I have never felt over-rehearsed. Hmm. I always feel like I could do, if I had an, another time, I could take that time to make it better. Wow. So we rehearsed so much. I mean, two months total. One with the band, uh, singers were in one room, at, band in one room, dancers in another room. Right. Then we all come together with all the special effects and stuff. And there, granted, there was a lot of time, some downtime for special effects, like bringing a tank on the stage with remote controllers, <laughs> you know, seeing the, some explosion for the first time. We were all out front watching that. And I'll never forget that because I was supposed to be right next to a big explosion and a bomb went off and I was supposed to take the guitar and I could go BAM and the explosion would happen. And I was, I don't know how many yards, quite a ways away when we saw it for the first time and even that far away the heat from the fire was, oh my God. <laughs> and I have to be right next to that. I never saw it on stage. I would always go. <laughs> the other way. <laughs> yeah, it was really exciting. It was so much fun. The first tour was a year and a half, and when it was over, I just wanted to cry. Yeah. This is like, oh no, real, real life again. No. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, he he shut down the Tokyo Disneyland so we could all hang out. Who does that? Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure there's a book inside of all of that someplace at some point that you could write just on that tour. Sure, yeah, it, it, was, it was a whole different thing. And what a wonderful way to see the world. Yeah, so you finish the tour. Where to next now? What happened next? After the first tour was over, uh, I went back to Michael Sambello and finished my first record, Above, Below, and Beyond. Right. And that took forever. It was a guitar record, and he was doing things with a lot bigger budgets. So I would get the hours, usually three in the morning to six or something. And <laughs> the, the best thing about those sessions was I learned how to do the auto punch. So nobody had to be around. Yeah. And not long after that, ADATS came out. Right. So um, I was self-sufficient and loving it. So I, I did the second record uh, several years later in my own place. Well, what, but what an experience so to, to write your own stuff and to produce that. And, and I know that Michael was a former Stevie Wonder guitarist. Yeah. So he was, I mean, he already had that behind him. He knew what he was doing at a very high level. Yeah. And how did you meet him? His engineer, engineer's girlfriend was taking guitar lessons from me. Hmm. <laughs> so that was a, an L.A. connection. Somebody knows somebody that knows somebody. Well, you have all these incredible things that have happened that just seem to fall into place at the right time. It's just really amazing. I think that's how it's supposed to work. Well, I, I think when, when you live your life with passion, doing what you yeah. love doing, that there are certain things that happen that way, yeah. which is beautiful. How did you, you know, in the sessions, we try to let a lot of the young musicians that are watching this or you know, people that have the desire to play music, you know, try to learn from, how did you maintain the business out of it? How, you know, did, did you organize things? Are you an organized person to make sure that things are on time? How, how, how do you run your business? Uh, it's, our business is kind of, kind of a bit haphazard. I mean, it's, I try to keep it as organized as I can, yeah. keeping folders with emails mm -hmm. and always getting back to people right away. Right. I don't ever make people wait, which right. is a big deal because you could lose a gig. Absolutely. You wait a day and they call somebody else. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm on top of it that way. You know, I, I started doing a seminar a couple summers ago, uh, traveling around America, and I call it self-empowerment for the modern musician. Mm. And I kind of treat it like TED Talks, like every 20 minutes we're going to go into this new area and things that I want musicians to know that I keep consistently finding that they don't know. Hmm. So I, I got that from Skype students. I said, well, you know this, don't you? And it, not necessarily scales and arpeggios and yeah. stuff. It's life skills or apps that are out now that save you a ton of time. Like what? Give me an example. Well, there's an app called Transcribe. Yeah. That I, I would start a church with that app if I could. Hmm. It's, uh, I, I just think back to the day when I, I spent so many hours trying to get everything completely accurate. Yeah. Um, 
with the cover band or whatever. Right, right. I right. wanted to know exactly what was going on and play it accurately. And back then it was cassettes. And we had these Morantz tape decks yeah. that, you know, you take the, the motor down and it takes the whole thing down in octaves. And, you know, well, digital age, this, this transcribe, you can slow anything down, you can change the pitch, which is awesome for singers because mm. a lot of young singers will try to sing in the key that's on the record, but it not, might not be ideal for them. It might not be their key, their range. Yeah. 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 I saw that in School of Rock. Uh, the, they had a, a thing a couple of years ago where they brought people from all over the world to perform. And there, was, there were some monstrous great players. Mm. But the one thing I noticed kind of consistently was a lot of the singers would, would sing in keys that were, they were really struggling with. And if they just had transcribed, you could pitch it up and just see how that feels. You can export it at a different um, key to the band, so you don't have to wait, waste time at rehearsals, uh, figuring out what key is best. And uh, you, can, you can even grab video from YouTube, drag it into it, and if you get a video where you see somebody's fingers, you could slow that down and see exactly what string they're oh, on, fantastic. see if they're picking yeah. or sweet picking. Yeah, it's just phenomenal. I, I learn every song with it now. So that's, that's one of the ones I'm very yeah, passionate cool. about. If I was to ask you to name me five guitar players that influence you, alive or dead, yeah. who would you name? Uh, Joe DiOrio. Joe DiOrio, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he had a huge influence on me uh, with the intervallic jumps, um, the string skipping, and just a very unique sound. Yeah. I mean, hardcore bebop, but then he went the way of Coltrane and Eddie Harris. He played with Eddie Harris. Right. And Eddie Harris was into the intervallic stuff that was from Nicholas Slonimsky. Mm. Uh, he's got a book called The Thesaurus of Scales and Melodic Patterns. Beautiful. And it's, it's like fly poop on paper. It's yeah. just crazy. <laughs> but it just really makes you think in a whole different way. So Joe DiOrio, okay. definitely. Jeff Beck was and still is my hero. I mean, that ultimate guitar player. The fact that you had the chance to play with him, that, this must have been an incredible, another high again for you. Yeah, that was definitely a, a that dream doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, it's not even a dream I had with him because he played with keyboard players. Yeah, I, I didn't even give it any thought that I could one day be on stage with him. Yeah, I, I just tracked him down for an autograph and gave him a CD, thinking, okay, bucket list cross off. And, and then, then, then he uh, he called a couple months later and said, I finally had a chance to listen to your record properly and let's do one together. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow. When you played with Jeff. When was that? 97 is when we actually played. Interesting. And is, uh, are there any DVDs or anything out that's available that has the... the yeah, yeah. The, yeah. We did a, a TV show in Tokyo, 1999. Yeah. That's available. That's fantastic. So, so Jeff Beck, who else would you say? Who would be number three for the guitar player? Oh, God, there's so many great guitar players. It's... Um, you know what I'm into lately is Brad Paisley. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I, I'm not a country fan, but yeah. his playing is so wacky. He, he's, he's one of those guys, like, like Michael, except he doesn't dance, yeah. that's so talented in so many different areas. He, he makes videos. His, his lyrics are hilarious, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just one of those energies that just stands out from the crowd. Hmm. So uh, that's one. Steve Morse. Steve, yeah. Uh, Preston Reed. Oh, wow. Is, yeah. a, is another one. Yeah. And at, I mean, at this point, I, I really like to listen to people that do things that I don't do because it's so fresh to my ear. Like the whole country guitar vocabulary is, is a foreign language to me. Yeah. So I, I enjoy it. Well, it's fantastic to experience that. So are, are you doing any teaching at all? Not that much. Uh, as far as one-on-one, -on -one, I, I do Skypes sometimes. Yeah all over the planet, which right. I'm having to get out my app, go, okay, Australia, <laughs> if you want it on the 4th, I have to do it on the 3rd. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. The day change, the time change, I go through all that, too, in my teaching. It's fantastic. Yeah. And a lot of clinics. Beautiful. Uh, I've, I've taught at um, colleges, done the clinics for Washburn, a lot for Digitech yeah. effects, and now with Fishman, with the Triple Play MIDI system. Yeah. I'm really having a ball with that. And this, this seminar that I put on a couple of years ago, I'm, I'm working on eventually banking it something that you can stream because people are writing me all the time, where can I get it? Well, yeah. 
I did one in Switzerland two <laughs> months ago, and then there was another one in Maine, you know. And the technology has changed, uh, yeah. as we know, tremendously. So, uh, but you said you use Skype, so you'll do some Skype you know, lessons. That's fantastic that you'll have that level of rapport with someone. Yeah, it's, it's so unbelievably cool. And I've also done it to entire classes. Mm. So they can bring me into the classroom and I don't have to get out of my jammies. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's for sure. I saw you give a clinic once uh, many, many years ago and you just, you just not only did you speak so well, but you played so great. Oh, thank you. And, and to see the audience just be in awe and as a great role model, as a woman to be out there in this crazy business, I mean, it really is incredible to have that level of exposure that you've had, that you've opened the doors and opportunities for many, many other women mm. to have the confidence, for these young women to have the confidence to go out there and say, man, Jennifer did it, I can do it. It's yeah, incredible. you know, back in the day, yeah. uh, when I was with Michael Jackson, I thought, okay, the revolution has begun, because yeah. Prince had Weddy and Lisa. Yeah. Billy Idol had a woman in his band at that time on MTV, high rotation. And I thought, wow, things are really changing. And I, when I went to GIT, I didn't realize how rare it was for a woman to play guitar. Yeah. You know, other than strumming a few chords and singing. When I arrived day one, I found out I, it was me and 59 guys. <laughs> that was it. As far as the revolution happening in 87, when, when Jackson happened, pretty much 30 years went by, nothing. Wow. Now, with the internet, now people can see other people. As, there's not a month that goes by I don't see some seven-year-old in, in Thailand that can kick my butt. How you know? unbelievable, right? How un yeah. In all instruments, I see it on the drumming scene. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. The, the power of being able to see somebody play. Yeah. And then think being able to slow it down to know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. That's, that's super powerful. There's there's so many women. I was hanging with Gretchen Men last night and <laughs> Neely Brosh, and it's like the whole new generation of kick butt women is happening. They're coming up, that's absolutely, but yeah. you, you led a very serious path and you opened up many, many doors. What motivates you? What, what, what drives you in the morning to get up and stay focused on the power of music? Creativity, number one, mm. the, the power of creativity. And it doesn't, for me, it doesn't have to be music anymore. Mm. I, I get into visual arts, I, I do a solo show in sync with videos that I make. And I get so obsessed. I, I could sit there for 14 hours, and if I didn't have to get up and pee, I wouldn't move. <laughs> you know? It's one of, the, one of those things that just makes you lose time. It's, it's just wonderful. And then I'm, I'm so hyper aware now that no matter what my mood is, if I play for an hour, it's going to change my brain chemistry. Yeah. And it's, it's very healing. So um, one of the motivators is it just keeps me sane, and I know it. Yeah. So I keep doing it. Are there young guitarists that you see that, that really, you know, you have faith that they're the next generation? Absolutely. So uh, my point is you're starting to see this next generation, that they're starting to really come, come to the table. Yeah. It's amazing to witness. Oh, it's, it's so joyous to <laughs> see it. You know, when, when so many kids are into video games and staying in their phones, yeah, yeah. that there are thousands of people that really want to play and are getting off on inventing something new. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me happy. That's fantastic. You know, the sessions, this, these artists series are about, you know, this next generation to be able to see great musicians that have come before them, to understand a little bit more about their history and to understand more about, you know, the business side of what it takes. You're obviously an organized person, you make things happen, you're motivated, and you, you create things to happen for you. Yeah. And that's why you have had and continue to have this incredible career. That's very, very powerful. In closing, what would you say to this next generation of what they should do to prepare themselves for a career in music, for, the, you know, for, for, the, for just the sheer passion that they feel? Mm. What can you give them to deliver them to be able to reach their dreams? One thing is to keep your ears open. Mm. I remember when I was at GIT, I was, jazz was it, that's it. I was listening to Charlie Parker three hours a day. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I remember making a crack to Bob Magnuson, upright bass player, one time about how jazz is so superior. And he kind of shut me down and said, he, keep your ears open yeah. to all genres. And that, that was kind of a slap upside the head. Yeah. And, and very powerful, because if you're gonna make a living in music, you can't just be the next Van Halen. You know, it might work for you, but most of us have to really expand and be able to teach, be able to do workshops, write books, play various styles with various musicians. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, just keep creativity at the core and just send it every which way. So be open to all different genres. Yeah. Have an open mind. Absolutely. Hard work. You obviously have worked hard and continue to work hard at your craft and writing and composing. That, that, that is a, a really admirable quality that a lot of these young kids probably should have. It's the, the satisfaction of it that keeps me coming back. It's mm. not like it's, oh, damn, I got to write a song today. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like, wow, where, where could this go? I just heard this new drum groove, and that's making me want to do this. Yeah. And, yeah, and I started working for uh, True Fire, uh, doing lessons online, and I, I got a few courses out, and they they do a lick series. You can do courses, licks, a, a lot of different kinds of things. Yeah, and that just sometimes a seed is planted, and at first I think, oh, I don't want to go that direction, and then a week later, I'm starting to go that direction. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and just exploring and uh, coming up with new stuff to to keep music fresh for myself, for yeah. one. Yeah. That's so. huge. But I love your enthusiasm. I love your passion for music. As a player, you really inspire in every note that you play. You really have that oh, thank depth. Thank you so much. You ha and going back to the, all your influences from listening to the records of years ago, you really have opened up doors for many great musicians, not just women, many, yeah. many guys that are inspired by your playing. So I think what you have done and what you continue to do is so unbelievable that you're on this wave of just pushing it forward and you continue to do that. On behalf of the sessions, we wish you the best of luck. Jennifer, thank Thanks. you so Thanks much. Thanks for having me. This was yeah. a <laughs>